Mr. Subramaniam needs no introduction to any of us. Um, and we are delighted and we are honored by him joining us today. Uh, judicial review is something uh, where Mr. Gopal Subramaniam has played an, a seminal role in the evolution of the law. Uh, he argued R. Gandhi's case on exclusion of Article 226 and 227. He argued Anil Katyar's case, judicial review of uh, ACR entries. He argued Rameshwar Prasad, which is the uh, Bihar Assembly dissolution case, which is judicial review of the governor's decision. He argued common cause, economic decisions, uh, Titagar Consortium, which is judicial review of uh, techno commercial decisions, Monica Gupta, Ashok Kumar Thakar, special reference one, which is uh, judicial review of judicial appointments, um, and something which is familiar to all of us, which is the Sterling Publications versus m and I think it's a 1993 case, judicial review of tendering process. So uh, we are so honored to have you, sir, with us today. Uh, and we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, uh, just a couple of uh, things. Anyone who has questions, please type in your questions in the chat box. And uh, we will ask uh, Mr. Subramaniam these questions as soon as uh, the presentation is over. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Srinath. Uh, it's a great pleasure to share my ideas about judicial review. Um, I need to make a few prefatory remarks uh, as I begin. Uh, yesterday, I had an opportunity to have a conversation with the members of the Madras Bar Association. And the concluding portion of my uh, conversation was in the context of judiciary. What is the role of the judiciary? And in a democracy, how is it meant to be counter-majoritarian. Actually, I want to start from there, this very subject of judicial review. Judicial review is actually a safety wall under the Constitution. Judicial review is actually all forms of review. And I'll come to a point which has often been overlooked. It is a point which uh, uh, the late Justice uh, V.R. Krishnaya, for whom I have uh, uh, a certain kind of abiding esteem and reverence, uh, empathized with, when I brought to his attention Article 32, sub Article 3, which enables Parliament to enact a law by which the powers of the Supreme Court can also be exercised by any other court, uh, even subordinate to a high court. And it is a very important article which tells us that judicial review is really the heart and soul of the Constitution. There can be no operativeness of uh, Article 13.2 by which the state which has been injuncted from encroaching on fundamental rights can be held accountable, except by judicial review. The entire rule of law, which is enshrined in Article 14, can never be implemented except by judicial review. The guarantees which are given in part three of the Constitution can never be enforced, can never be upheld, can never be safeguarded, except by judicial review. So judicial review, in my view, is very important for the observance of the Constitution and is intended to be a scrutiny by which courts can examine executive actions, administrative actions, statutory actions, statutory orders, statutory instruments, subordinate legislation, state legislation, central legislation, everything can be examined. And that is done on what fortunately for us we have in our constitution, which is not available in Britain, is we have a theory of legality which is set out within the constitution. So when the contours of legality are to be found within the constitution, then there is, uh, uh, there is no exclusion of judicial review. 
I'll come to the, I hope you're hearing me, Srinath. Yes, sir, very clearly, sir. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to come back to the point that when judicial review exists, the constitution actually breathes, it comes to life. And as Justice uh, Krishnaya used to say very often in courts when he was hearing a matter, that is what the constitution spake. And he used to use that expression S-P-A-K-E. -E. He would often say, and what a remarkable judge, he would say there is only one witness you need to your actions the constitution does the constitution affirm or denounce or reject your action that is the basis for the purpose of coming to a conclusion whether an action is legal or illegal now in constitutional scrutiny we have again multifold dimensions we have dimensions first in administrative law we have dimensions in relation to actions of statutory authorities we have then scrutiny of behavior of constitutional authorities including public service commissions then we have shall we say judicial review of subordinate legislation and lastly we have judicial review of plenary legislation, whether it is enacted by the state legislature or whether it is enacted by the central legislature. Now, if the judiciary has to perform this kind of a function, then in my view, there are certain, shall I say, inarticulate premises on the basis of which alone this function can be performed. The first is a very high degree of independence. And I will speak about this hopefully in the course of the conversation as well. The independence which is required is very high because the ability to interfere with executive action is slightly more difficult than the ease with which an action can be affirmed. This is human. Therefore, we have to understand, even in terms of the psychological nature of the function of adjudication, the capacity to search and dig out whether the action satisfies all the parameters of rationality as is understood in the constitutional sense is something which requires an extraordinary degree of independence. And I'm saying this with reference to contemporary context. And I need to say this because I would fail in my duty to appear to be somewhat oblivious to the reality which we are facing. That it is very important that as members of the bar, we always stand up for the independent judiciary actually having the maximum, not only moral support from profession, from legal professionals like you, but I think a collective uh, support is absolutely required. Otherwise, uh, uh, it will not be possible for judges to be absolutely independent given all the circumstances which exist in today's, in today's world. The second aspect, which is again a premise is, there has to be a certain degree of inspiration which must have flown uh, into our uh, system. So the whole purpose of continuity or from the past and also shall we say, continuing legal education for the future is that we are human, but we have the capacity to be enriched by the savants of the past and their learning 
and their way of approaching cases. And we also have the possibility of having a peep into the future, which greater acquisition of knowledge and greater expertise, which we can acquire by our own effort, individual effort. This has a bearing also on uh, judicial review. Now, let me come very quickly to the first part that it didn't take very long in England. In England, with, it was with reference to a doctor. And, uh, and in uh, United States, it, it was, of course, with reference to that famous case of Marbury versus Madison. In both these cases, of course, the powers of upholding the law, declaring the law, and invalidating illegal actions was finally declared as the province of the courts. But in India, we didn't need that. In India, you had an Article 132, you had an Article 32, you had an Article 226. And we must bear in mind, when you look at the strength of judges, which was initially placed uh, in the Constitution for the Supreme Court, the intention at that time, possibly of the Constitution makers was that high courts and the Supreme Court would be more or less, shall I say, although one would also be a court of appeal, but would be of relative gravity, relative equality in gravity. This is a very important point which I'm making again in another context, that there is a certain degree of hierarchy which has been uh, brought to focus over a period of time. But that was not really the intention of the framers of the Constitution. They expected the justices of the High Court and the justices of the Supreme Court were a large body of members of an independent judiciary in a collective sense. Now, let me come to the first aspect about invalidating laws. I'm now going backwards. That is, I'm starting with Article 13.2. We, of course, started with the time-honored criteria of reasonable classification. When reasonableness had to be tested, you either tested it with reference to Article 14, or you tested it with reference to Article 19.2. But in some sense, the reasonable classification theory was not entirely short of limitations as was perceived later. It was still a very strong theory. If you go by the logic and rationality of the theory of reasonable classification, it was a very rational and logical theory. And it had a four-step inquiry. And it is so strange that I see sometimes what we wrote uh, in the early 50s is reflected in a judgment in the United Kingdom in 2015 uh, by Lord Manns in a, in a very famous judgment. And, and how is it that our Supreme Court put it in the early beginning was that is there, first of all, a classification? Secondly, is there an object which is sought to be achieved? Is there an intelligible differentia for that classification? And does that intelligible differentia seek to subserve the purpose for which that law is made? Now, if the purpose is itself ignoble, it falls foul of the Constitution. If there is no intelligible differentia, it again falls foul of the Constitution. If the intelligible differentia does not actually subserve the purpose, or is, again, Justice Krishnaya's judgment in that land acquisition case is a masterpiece on what is collateral, collateral exercise of power. 
The purpose is not that, but it achieves some other purpose. It falls by the wayside. Again, it is foul of the Constitution. This theory of reasonable classification, of course, in the context of Article 19.2, it was with reference to the nature of the restriction, the extent of the restriction, the nature of the right, the burden which the restriction sought to impose, and the proportionality as well in relation to it. All these are matters of exposition of constitutional law in the early 50s. But later, as a result of the judgment in R.C. Cooper, when the Supreme Court rightly found that Articles 14, 19, 21, all of them were not really disparate. They had a sense of overlap. It was far better that a more rigorous test was applied, a test by which the law had to be consistently compliant with the demands, shall I say, of satisfying non-arbitrariness, which was a part of Article 14. So we had another dimension. The concept of non-arbitrariness was really in the context of, shall I say, administrative action. But that concept in administrative law, in uh, first in Royapas case, then it so happened that concept suddenly flowed into what we believe as purely constitutional law in Menaka Gandhi. And then we find in Menaka Gandhi the affirmation of the principle 14, 19, 21, all of them have to be satisfied. Then you have the rule of law. Now, rule of law by itself under Article 14 is relevant. When I speak about now legislation made by a state legislature, is it ultra-virus the Constitution? Again, rule of law. If it is ultra-virus, the past conferred upon a state legislature, it is ultra-virus. Secondly, if it is subordinate legislation, is it again intra-virus the statute under which it has been issued or promulgated or framed? Again, it is a question of rule of law under Article 14. So the theory of ultra-virus is really a part of the rule of law. The concept of excessive delegation is again a facet of the rule of law. And this is very necessary for us to understand that the fundamental rights chapter, along with Article 13.2, along with the functions of the courts, because they had the powers of issuing the writs. Now, the writs also additionally gave us a vantage point to know the nature of judicial review. So in India, we were actually blessed because you had, on the one hand, Article 13.2, you had all the fundamental rights, and on the other hand, you also had the prerogative writs mentioned, or such other suitable writ, which meant that we had the capacity to issue any suitable writ to address executive or legislative action. There is a judgment of the late Justice A.P. said in a judgment called Chingleput Bottlers. It's a very unusual judgment because it's one of the few judgments which said that you can always issue a writ of certiorari coupled with a mandamus. That is, you can find by an examination of the records that there is a misdirection and you can issue then a mandamus for the purpose of reconsidering it, having regard to relevant considerations. Now, the fact that legislation is arbitrary is a ground to have it struck down. And that is uh, as a result of recent pronouncements of the Supreme Court, where they have said if legislation is arbitrary, it goes under 14. So today we have, shall I say, a very strong constitutional ethos under the Constitution to interfere with any legislative act which does not subserve the constitutional boundaries of legality. 
Now we come to a slightly more, shall I say, contentious area in, 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 in adjudication, in judicial review. What is that contentious area? What happens if the purposes are unconstitutional? Facially, a law may look safe, but the purpose which it seeks to achieve is completely an unconstitutional or shall we say an extraneous purpose. What does judicial review involve in such a case? In my view, vigorous judicial review is the order of the day. And we must say that the standards of judicial review in India have inspired other jurisdictions. And we should not go back upon our own benchmarks. The standards of our judicial review have inspired the Pakistani judiciary in a very major way. We must know today that the reputation of the Pakistani judiciary is very high. If someone has looked at the recent uh, judgments, the three chief justices who have followed one after the other in, in Pakistan, in the Supreme Court, their judiciary has stood up and the judiciary has drawn inspiration from the Indian Supreme Court. And that is a matter of great pride for us. And we must understand that our robustness in dealing with issues, whether by way of public interest litigation, whether it be by way of judicial review, has brought us laurels all over the world. I now come to a very important aspect at this juncture. Recently, in the United Kingdom, there was a question whether the prorogation of Parliament, which Prime Minister Johnson achieved was legal or illegal. That led to an inquiry in a case called Miller, Miller II, Roman II. But the judgment of the UK Supreme Court is 29 pages, full of learning, absolutely precise. The judges made three points. The first they said, the mere fact that something has a political hue does not mean that judges will not do their duty whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, whatever it is, it's a duty. We have to perform an adjudicatory function. We cannot be, we cannot be uh, uh, disenfranchised from doing that duty by saying this is a political question or it is a political matter. The second thing the judges said is that uh, there is a point at which all prerogative ends. All privileges also end, as was held in Raja Rampa. There is a point when there is a final action, whether it is one of prorogation, whether it is one of expulsion. It becomes justiciable. But very importantly, the third point is most important. They used the very framework of their democratic construct as the basis of saying that therefore lack of legality follows. And this is very subtle. What is the construct? The construct is you have a cabinet form of government, which is accountable to parliament. If parliament is prorogued, the accountability ceases. So can you have a cabinet which is not accountable at all? Now for that decision, they said, sorry, they said the theory of separation of powers itself contemplates that first of all, there is a legislative body to which you're accountable. So we see that as an area which gives us an opportunity to examine whether you have at all any justification. Then they asked for justification. 
They said, we don't find any justification. Therefore, we invoke the doctrine of legality. And we say that this action is void. So some, now this is very interesting. These are somewhat uh, sui generis expressions in English law. Void. Not, not in accordance with the theory of legality. But the fact is that they did take that view. And it is to the credit of the Prime Minister that he appeared through council, he put forward the material, and he showed the notes as they are. They are reflected in the judgment. And it is also to the credit of the Prime Minister that he, he, he complied with the judgment and reconvened Parliament. And then, of course, later called for elections. But the point is that this is an example where Without a written constitution, judges had to use on fundamental principles of constitutional law. Whereas we are very fortunate because we have a written constitution and we have so much within the constitution to guide us in terms of uh, judicial uh, review. The next aspect which I wish uh, you to kindly uh, consider with me is in matters of judicial review is an oft quoted argument of deference and this is uh, this is something which we need to examine rather closely the theory of presumption of constitutionally constitutionality of a statute the latitude which should be given to the executive or what is called free play in joints I don't think can be overstretched in today's India. No, with passage of time, I'm afraid time-honored presumptions have also yield, have got to yield to greater scrutiny. And there is no harm in that. In fact, the greater the scrutiny, greater is the governance. And this is something which yokes me back to a point that when the Janata government came to power, at that time, and that is a very important uh, turn in the judicial history of India. As you would have known, that there were Two judges who were transferred in the course of the infamous emergency era. One was a judge by the name of Sakulchan Shet. He was a judge of the Gujarat High Court in Gandhian. And uh, I had the great privilege of appearing against him in the Supreme Court as a youngster, a man of extraordinary values and character, old world. Then Justice B.J. Divan, who later went to the, he was transferred to the Andhra Pradesh High Court. Justice Shakal Chand Shed had filed a red petition questioning his transfer. And there is a very important tale in this. Mr. Sheikh was represented by Mr. H.M. Sirvai. The matter was called out. The then Attorney General said that Mr. Justice Sheikh will be retransferred to Gujarat. And similarly, Justice Divana would be retransferred to Gujarat, and therefore the petitions can be dismissed. But what is very important is the court said, we will record the statements, we will dismiss the petitions. But we do think that from the standpoint of independence of the judiciary, we must say something about transfer of judges. 
and they dealt with the subject of transfer of judges. But there was a very important footnote to the point. The footnote was, there was a self-corrective ability within the government to concede what was not correct. There was also the ability of the government to permit the courts to examine the validity of their actions. Just as in Menaka Gandhi's case, again, one of the very great uh, members of the legal profession, the late Mr. S. V. Gupte, whom again I had a great opportunity to know, he was the Attorney General at that time, and he conceded in Menaka Gandhi that this order was bad. It was in violation of the principles of natural justice. And he said that he would offer a hearing. But the court said we would still like to render. We would still like to go into the matter. But the Attorney General never prevented any scrutiny. The point is, unless and until we encourage scrutiny by courts, and this desire not to encourage scrutiny is disconcerting. Courts must actually scrutinize actions because that is the only safety wall as far as the citizens of India is concerned. There is going to be a subtle footnote here. We must not forget that something is called law, something is called legal, but something is also called legitimate. Now, there is a little difference in all the three. One is law, one is legal, one is legitimate. The third has a certain degree of borrowing someone's armory for the purpose of protection. We must not forget that today there is only one organ in this country under the constitution which can give the third that is the judiciary by way of judicial review so under judicial review it is the courts which impart a certain degree of legitimacy shall i say to the actions which have been brought up before them for scrutiny and therefore, judicial review has to be very careful because courts are not meant to impart imprimaturs of legitimacy unless they are completely satisfied that very high thresholds are met. Now, we must understand Considerations of deference, considerations of lack of technical expertise. Yes, sometimes they are valid, but they are relative considerations. They are not considerations which have an absolute character to them. They are completely mobile considerations in the judicial calculus. Now, when you have these considerations, you still have to come to a consideration whether the action is legal or not. Notwithstanding the claim to expertise, notwithstanding the claim that this is an executive function or it's a legislative judgment. We often hear of that cliched expression, wisdom of the legislature. I don't mean that with any disrespect. Sometimes people act very wisely. Some of the best of debates are to be seen. I, I say that with respect, but I'm saying that it's not a ground on which judicial review must be either attenuated or for that matter of fact, it should be lowered. Judicial review must be heightened. And it is very important when we do judicial review, we only look at the cause and the list because we live in very trying times 
We live in times which are so trying that uh, any, any view which can be taken may have a complete aftertale of its own to unfold. But that is the great test with judges who today undertake judicial review have to undertake it. History has placed them in that position, maybe of relative awkwardness, but it is an important function. This function has to be performed with a great deal of care and a great deal of fearlessness because, as I mentioned to you, that the human tendency to look comfortable in declining judicial review, it is a lot more difficult and a lot more uh, stretched out and exerted, exerting on the judicial ability, discernment and a multiplicity of factors to be able to detect what are the different interests which are actually at play. Now, I need to say something here in fairness, because this is a very important point which I need to make today. Justices Krishna Iyer, Justice Desai, Justice Chinat Reddy, they were all considered to be what are called judges left of the center. And today I need to say this because I have been in the Supreme Court and I want to say that people did not understand quite accurately what this meant. They did not understand what did this mean being left of the center. For the three judges, when cases came up before them, they also wanted to go behind the mere facade of A versus B to C where they also symptomatically representative of the class they represented. If it was a workman, he represented a class. If it was a management, he represented a class. If it was a landlord, he represented a class. If it was a tenant, he represented a class. So they did actually uncover, in my particular view, the form and that is very necessary to bear in mind. The uh, second aspect which I need to make out is that is how a large number of appeals were admitted in landlord tenant matters. A few years later, they were all taken up one by one, one by one and finished off in a few seconds because judges thought that this was a complete error in admitting the matter. They did not realize that there was a certain understanding and perception sociologically, which persuaded at that time judges to actually admit these cases. The reason why I'm bringing this up is we must have some continuum of perception. There are no de novo standards of beginning in judicial functions. Judicial function is, like T.S. Eliot said, it is a blend of tradition and individual talent. The tradition is from the past and it has to be imbibed and it has to be imbibed very impersonally. The impersonality is the greatest element here. The individual talent has to be expressed in totally impersonal terms. That's why uh, there in judicial review, the ability to transcend is so important. More often than not, you would have seen in many of the judgments all over the world, judges personably or personally may like or dislike a view, but the final judgment is based on hardcore considerations of the factors which emerge in that particular case. Therefore, it's always reasons which lead you to the conclusion, but not the sensation of the conclusion first. 
This is very important for judicial review. I think I have taken exactly 40 minutes. Uh, that's five more minutes than what I had intended. And I'm very, very happy to share this platform with you. And I'll be delighted to, uh, to be asked any questions and uh, to, to have a conversation. I'm more than happy. Thank you so much, sir, for, for that uh, really enlightening and wonderful talk to us. Uh, one of the questions I had pertains to what you said about uh, uh, striking down a legislation or an action on the basis of discrimination. Now, so discrimination. discrimination. Now, reasonable classification requires intelligible differentia having a nexus to the purpose sought to be achieved. Is it possible that differentia may have um, relevance at one point of time, but not later. So can a particular classification made in the times of COVID be unconstitutional later on? Uh, so is judicial review on the basis of efflux of time or passage of time, is that perm permissible in your view? Yes. Answer is yes. Because law is always evolving. Reasonableness itself is an evolutionary concept. What is reasonable in 1950 may be utterly unreasonable today. But what is reasonable today because of extraordinary circumstances may simply cease to be unreasonable a few weeks later. Um, Justice, uh, Justice Seshasai, uh, would you like to ask the question yourself? Good morning, sir. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. Oh, good morning. I'm yeah, good sir. morning, sir. Uh, I'm just wondering, like uh, in a situation, though it is subjudice in quite a few places, and the uh, role of a uh, judicial review in a, uh, in a situation like Shaheen Bagh, where assertion of fundamental right, one, one aspect of fundamental right under, under 19.1a, has in come in conflict with uh, another uh, another right of fundamental way of right of mobility and uh, what is the role of judicial review in such situations well uh, I sir, to be very honest with you be no, I'm glad that you asked this question and I think I, I have to give an answer to this uh, today it is very important and, and may I, I just write the, please, whole idea, please, please. the whole idea is Hitherto, I understand from whatever I get to read from, uh, I mean, newspapers or social media, judicial review means it's all about co trying to protect the, I mean, I mean, the rights of the citizen from the executive or from the, the state. And, uh, there's a, and, and, and the citizens as such, they need not worry so much about infringing others' fundamental right. And uh, so, so this, is, this is something I get to read in social media, though I try to make, I mean, though I maintain my neutrality about it, since it's a neutral forum, I thought I will ask you. Thank you, sir. Uh, this question relating to these protests which have been happening. Um, first is, sir, we must know what is the right which the protesters are exercising. This is a right which is embedded under the constitution under 191A. And the right to protest validly in a reasonable way is granted and it is guaranteed under the Constitution. And I think the first step is to recognize this right. If we do recognize, uh, recognize this right, now people may disagree with the movement, but we cannot disagree with the fact that they have a right to express their points of view. I, I would only say that today morning I had the opportunity to read uh, Dr. Amartya Sen's uh, article in The Wire. And uh, he also, I mean, more or less, uh, we all take the same position that in a democracy which is governed by the rule of law, we have to first acknowledge what are the rights which inhere in the protesters. The second, the right of movement which you mentioned. These are matters where there can be a certain degree of flexibility which can be achieved. But that's a separate point. But merely because the, right, the protesters are large in number and are occupying the road, 
is not a ground to say that they don't have a right to protest. Therefore, the right to mobility, suppose you can find, sir, the mobility in just taking the other side of the road for 600 meters. I do not think that mobility is at stake at all. So with great respect, and although these matters are pending, no. I feel uh, in, in terms of my own uh, independent perception that the relative strength which you have to give to a right is the crucial point. Do no. we give recognition to the right of a person to hold a view? Or are we really allowing that to be subordinated to mobility of traffic on the road? No, I just try to actually uh, want to uh, add a supplement here. May I? Please, no. please. The point is, I do not say for once that uh, the freedom, I mean, the fundamental right to free speech must be subordinate to anything. All I would rather try to believe that notwithstanding the fact that Article 19, the rights are, I mean, uh, 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 typed in a certain CDL, uh, in a certain CDI term, the one in the uh, above must be given preference to the one uh, below because it all depends on ultimately balancing it. My only concern is whether judicial review is all about managing the fundamental rights of an individual vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the state, or is there not judicial, or should not the judicial review extend itself to balance the fundamental rights of both categories of citizens? Because Sir, here, I, I, I'll just I'll finish it, one, one more sentence. Please. Here, the state is not interfering. For suppose, for, in, uh, for instance, I, for, I come to the court as a citizen, I say, so let somebody file, I mean, express the free speech. I have no worry about it. But where is my right of way? The Constitution has given me. Who is to say that which is superior, which is inferior, how to balance that right? The state has not interfered. Only I say as an individual, I want to use this road. This probably is, I mean, one, one can, how you want to balance it? So this, and whether in this context, the role of judiciary in the context of constitutional judicial review under the Constitution, it is not something between the citizen and the state, but citizen and the citizen, and the state is a spectator. How we are, how we are going to position it? Sir, this is a very, very, a very valid point. Let me take up the first point, which you, talk, which you mentioned about balance. Sir, usually, uh, I, speaking for myself in standards of judicial review, there has to be clarity in coming to a conclusion that in a dialogue of rights versus the state, rights of a citizen versus the state, the citizen either has the rights or he doesn't have the rights. But there is nothing called the right of the state per se. And I'll develop this in a moment. That is as far as the first point is concerned. However, when you use the word balance, that's very important. The theory of balance comes in when there is a defense to encroachment of rights on the basis of what we call in jurisprudence as competing interests. Now, competing interests or the claim to competing interests is completely just issue. And there, sir, in judicial review, one would have to examine whether these com competing interests are a real and second, are there sufficient justification for the purpose of justifying encroachment on fundamental rights? The second question which you posed, what happens where the state is a spectator? And there are two individuals, one who asserts the right to free speech and the second who claims that he must have the mobility. Now, so there the examination is, it's not one of supremacy of rights. They may be equally important for the court to examine that is there a severe inconvenience or public interest which is jeopardized in terms of mobility? It's a perfectly valid question. However, if the court is satisfied that it is within the realm of executive management, the control of mobility, it will first ask the executive to look at it. But 
it will also be very sensitive to the fact that there is a primary right which is also being asserted by way of free speech. These sometimes can become a little more contested, contentious. But as you rightly said, sometimes it is a question of clarity. Either you have rights, if you have rights, the state can't claim rights. It can only accord, it has to recognize the rights. But where it's a question of competing interests, then, sir, we actually descend from the realm of rights to what we call as interest versus interest, you know, that paradigm which we have in jurisprudence of competing interests. Then it's a value judgment which the court makes having regard to constitutional principles. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. The next question is from uh, Harishankar. And his question is, uh, under what circumstances do you think parliament can make a law under Article 32.3 to confer upon some other court those powers? Well, the uh, circumstances can be many. I personally think that that article I referred to only to make the point that parliament at the time when the constitution was enacted contemplated a classless judiciary. And I'm making that now somewhat uh, very uh, openly amongst uh, this, uh, this uh, collective circle of friends whom I'm ad addressing. I don't have to be very, very politically correct at this moment. It is meant to be a classless judiciary. It's not a hierarchical judiciary. In other words, the caliber of judges which constitution makers contemplated was that a great district judge would be as good as a Supreme Court judge and vice versa. Or a High Court judge would be as great as a Supreme Court judge. Which is why if you look at the sheer statistics, you will find that in the first 10 years from 1950 to 60, the strength of the Supreme Court was a very limited number. And you would also see that there are records which indicate that many chief justices of high courts didn't come to the Supreme Court. They actually declined becoming justices of the Supreme Court. So we must understand that there was a certain understanding at that time that this was not some sort of a, a hierarchical structure, one over the other, one controlling. This really was not contemplated with great respect. When the constitution was framed, if I were ever to imagine that the constitution makers invested powers in a group of people to deal with other justices, not at all. They didn't deal with this. This is all uh, completely a development which has happened much later. Therefore, 32.3, the condition precedent for 32.3, in my view, is that you have judges of equilibility as those in the High Court and the Supreme Court. If you have the same quality of judicial independence, then you can enact a law under 32.3. But it must be of judges. That's very important. It's courts. The, the, the institution which can be empowered by a law made by parliament under 32.3 is only in respect of courts, not tribunals. And this brings me to a point today all the work which used to be jurisdiction, which vested in the high courts, has been simply plucked away piece by piece, piece by piece, piece by piece, to a multiplicity of tribunals. The tribunals, I'm sorry, notwithstanding our Gandhi's judgment, and I want to say this very bluntly, notwithstanding the judgment of the Supreme Court, does not have the majority of judicial members. It's a reality. You will always find that there are executive members who are appointed. And I think the tribunalization of justice has been one of the core reasons why it has had a great impact in weakening judicial review by itself. Because if under Article 226 today, you have a tendency to say, why don't you go to a specialized tribunal for redressal of your grievance or what this is a very serious point that tribunalization has actually affected the the basic structure 
of the judiciary. And one more word, one more comment I wish to make here, Srinath. I have been very bitterly disappointed in the use of this expression called subordinate judiciary. I appeal to all lawyers and judges never to use that word because the judiciary below the High Court is actually dealt with under the Constitution. They are holding positions which are recognized by the Constitution. If judges who are in the trial court, sessions court, are actually holding offices which are directly traceable to offices which are described in the Constitution under Article 235, I'm afraid we have no, we should not ever call them. And, and, and this is very important because this whole theory of somebody being subordinate to someone else is, 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 is deleterious to judicial independence. It is one thing to oversee in fraternity, but it is entirely another thing to actually exercise what is called as a form of uh, disciplinary control. This is, a bit, that is why the, the trend in 32.3 is important because we have to ensure one day the district judges or the judges who are there are as good as anybody else. And that should be our dream. Our dream must ultimately be, and that's the, that is the reality in many parts of the world. You can, I can say uh, that there are district judges in in United States. If you look at some of their judgments, you would not be able to. If the same man could have actually sat in the Supreme, and many have. There are many judges who you know have marched from very very small positions, but they've come right up to the top. But you will also find many judges who have rendered judgments in the in the in the in the in the, in the district court. They are as eloquent as judgments of the highest court. So our aim must always be to encourage the trial courts to be a part of this entire combined discourse in judicial review. Thank you, sir. The next question was one from me, which is probably a slightly selfish question, but it takes up from what you are saying. Now, one me uh, after Chandra Kumar. What the legislature has started doing is to provide a hierarchy of appeals directly to Supreme Court, like, for example, the uh, Insolvency and Bankruptcy Court, the Companies Act, the Competition Act, the Electricity Act. You have a tribunal, you have an appellate tribunal, and a straight appeal to the Supreme Court. So the high courts are getting knocked out. Uh, what, what is your view about that? I personally do not agree with that approach at all. I think this, again, speaking for myself, is violative of the basic structure of the Constitution. However much you need, you can have, you can have a statutory provision fixing a certain time limit within which the matter can be dealt with by a specialized division of the High Court. But that's a separate point. But still the High Courts must never be bypassed. And this is the real point. So we have actually a tribunal which Technically, under the Constitution, is well below the High Court. Please consider this. You have a tribunal which is below the holder of a constitutional uh, functionary like the High Court, but yet the appeal is straight to the Supreme Court, bypassing the High Court. In principle, it is completely wrong, completely wrong. And this must be understood. So the fact that you have a former judge of the Supreme Court who is the chairman of a tribunal does not make any difference, not a job of difference to the point that the tribunal is under law subject to scrutiny by, uh, by, a, by the High Court in constitutional sense. Let me give you another example. Suppose you are an arbitrator and uh, you, you render an award you have to take the consequences of your award being impeached in whichever jurisdiction the proceeding can competently lie. Which is why there were earlier orders which used to be passed, I mean, in the exercise of these extraordinary powers by the Supreme Court, like Article, obviously it was with reference to Article 142, but they would do it very often 
in cases where they refer matters to arbitration, then the award will be filed in this court. If it was a former judge of the Supreme Court, they would add a further line. I'm talking of the pre-1996 regime. They would pass an order that the award shall be filed in this court. That's the Supreme Court. But then there was a considerable amount of criticism of that as well. Because should the normal process of law be supplanted? And that is why Article 142, right from the time of Justice Gajendra Ganka, who was absolutely clear, his position in Premchandgarh has never been diluted, that Article 142 can do justice in circumstances which are not occupied by a statute, but where the subject matter is actually covered by a statute, then in that particular case, it cannot be supplanted. It cannot be. An order inconsistent with the statute cannot be passed. That was the judgment in Antule, that you cannot pass an order which is a variance with the statute. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question is from Bhaskar, who asks you, in your opinion, where is the balance between judicial activism and judicial restraint in the course of judicial review? Well, first of all, public interest litigation was intended to be an effective instrument for the purpose of ensuring that rights were available to the underprivileged. Before public interest lit litigation became very pronounced in 1980, we must not forget that there were pronouncements by Justice Krishnaya and Justice Bhagwati in the early 70s. Justice Krishnaya also was one of the first uh, progenitors of legal aid in this country. Yeah, very few people are aware that uh, he had, uh, he had, of course, a multiple, he, he was a polycentric person. He was a minister, he was a member of the Law Commission, and he was also perhaps one of the most legendary figures in our, uh, our judiciary. One, I think, uh, I, I don't see parallels of that uh, person, will not be able to see that. But the point is that legal aid and access to justice, public interest litigation actually got intertwined with each other. This is very necessary to understand. You cannot have access to justice unless you give legal aid. Now to give legal aid, you must also have the capacity of someone else representing a person or espouse a cause in public interest. So therefore the three were intertwined and you had then a certain evolution of law in public interest. Now, any remedy is also susceptible to misuse. But the fact that it can be misused or is misused or is abused must never allow us to decry the value of that remedy. The fact that some people are misusing the remedy, there are other means by which Judicial orders can take care of that kind of a situation of abuse. But it is not a very good ground for the purpose of decrying or denying the validity of that remedy. I wish to tell you that if it was not for public interest litigation, and today most of the contentious litigations are actually by public interest litigation uh, petitioners, very distinguished members of civil society. They're the only ones who are today are picking up causes and bringing them to the court with a lot of fearlessness. Now, I'm putting the question that these are important instances which where the courts do interfere. The courts have interfered. The courts have interfered, for instance, even in the validity of the grant of the 2G license. They did that at the instance of two public interest petitioners, Dr. Swami, as well as the Center for Public Interest Litigation. So the point I'm making is, there is nothing pejorative about public interest litigation. Now, judicial activism, when you act in a public interest litigation matter, yes, you are bound to act if constitution is violated, you give a declaration. 
Now, there can be other cases of public interest litigation, which are in the nature of foreign into executive area. In such cases, in my personal opinion, the first opportunity must be given to the executive to actually act properly in its executive function. But if it does not act in that executive area, then the courts are compelled to design a set of working directions until the executive is completely sensitive and conscious of its function as an executive functionary. Now, this is very important. I will tell you as an eyewitness in behalf. 30 years ago, you must put yourself back by 30 years. I used to see petitions under Article 226. The orders which would be passed usually would be, please go and make a representation to the collector. Repetition two, please, you passed an order. Why don't you please get that order enforced? Another order, please do it within four weeks. Then a third order. And now please understand, people were running out of breath, coming to the court, going back to the same authority was denied them justice. Now, this is very necessary for you to know because judges were aware that there could be apathy. There could be sometimes lack of awareness. There could be indifference. Under those circumstances, the culture of judicial activism came about. But can we think honestly of 10 cases where judicial activism was a clear overreach into the executive sphere? I'm not able to. Vishaka guidelines? Certainly not. The space was open before parliament intervened by making a law. Therefore, the court uh, gave guidelines. Court gave guidelines even in, the, in that uh, uh, safe, uh, common safe case. Court has given guidelines in numerous cases where in public interest it felt that those guidelines ought to preserve the territory of public interest until there was an articulated formulation by the government itself. But yes, the caveat is, this must not be an instrument for legitimation. This is very important. One is to abuse the process. The second is to gain legitimation because it is the court. So both these have to be safeguarded. Uh, may I, <coughs> I'm Sesha Sai here. May I come in, sir? Please. I'm uh, since I've been quoting Justice Krishna, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, amply, I thought uh, I've, I've been a sort of a law clerk under Justice Krishna in the early 90s. Uh, between 91 95, I practiced in Elanakulam High Court. And uh, so at that time, I had uh, been uh, attached to his office trying to assist him. He used to have few I mean, young lawyers to assist him. So I was one. And uh, Justice Krishna, I just asked Justice Krishna one question. Uh, I remember uh, what is, I mean, what is the outer contours of judicial activism and what separates uh, judicial activism from judicial anarchy? Because those were the words which used to be uh, frequently used uh, in those times. And uh, he said constitution. If there is an immediate constitutional purpose to intervene, court should step in. Otherwise, keep quiet and leave it to the legislature and the executive. And that's what he told me. If there's no co immediate constitutional purpose to intervene, don't intervene. There must be a constitutional purpose. And don't overstep the constitution. And I think you, you brought, brought it out uh, exceedingly well. Thank you so much. I think uh, Justice Krishna should not have put it uh, uh, better. And, and you see, uh, you know, uh, when, you, when you think of Justice Krishna, I'm glad you spoke about him. You see, I, there's so many aspects of his personality which is so relevant today. I, I mean, I don't know how to relive him. If there was a way to relive him, uh, I, I would like to relive him in some process. You see, his fearlessness. He was so fearless. I'm an eyewitness, and very few people, maybe even eyewitnesses, when the former Prime Minister Indira Gandhi's election appeal was heard in the vacation in 1974 and he was the vacation judge and I want everyone to know this he started the hearing at the dot of 10 30 
he actually sat through that evening till about 7 six forty-five, seven, and he stood up and he said i'll pronounce orders they'll be pronounced tomorrow but his behavior in court was so calm so impartial so unfazed that you can imagine the impact it had on everybody and at that time they had to open all the doors in that chief justice's court hall so that people could actually see the proceeding at least 20 feet down it was extraordinary and uh, his conduct in court even in presiding over as a judge the questions which he posed and at that time uh, there were some uh, compelling standards of conduct which he expected from lawyers lawyers were officers of the court lawyers had a duty to be accurate lawyers had a duty not to raise an uh, impertinent point they never could address the court improperly and above all if you were appearing for the state it was a duty to concede what was wrong now i find that over a period of time is viewed as a matter of utter suspicion but in justice krishnaya's time he would very often if suppose he and, and i'm talking of the uh, topmost law officers of the country they were extremely particular when they appeared in justice krishnaya's court lest they said anything which was not appropriate for a law officer he compelled very high standards to be maintained by the way additionally you must know that uh, he is one of the few judges who, who started this pooling of judges in the car uh, so that it was not only an economical measure but it was also a way by which there was a lot of brotherhood which judges had and that was one of the best he was he was a great contributory in the social fabric of the uh, supreme court he held the court together by his charisma by his magnetic uh, personality and uh, and look at his austerity look at his being look at the purity with which he lived after retirement did he seek any office did he seek anything from any executive government i mean it is unimaginable is it not a is it not is it not the kind of life which all of us must uh, be inspired by uh, i mean what all he has done uh, post his retirement whether it be by way of writing whether it be by way of even lokniti as you are aware he was a person who was wanting probity in public life particularly in matters of electoral expenditure he wrote uh, uh, unceasingly and his personal life of contributing for any public good and uh, keeping nothing for himself i mean it's a, it's a remarkable life a remarkable life so i have a follow up this is baska here i have a follow up question in yes. relation to uh, judicial activism and the exercise of powers under article 142 as my understanding is that article 142 which clothed the supreme court with the power to do substantial ju complete justice in matters was essentially a power to do to uh, to pass judgments which would do a lot of good to a lot of people is there a case for example the, the rule of article uh, the uh, powers of the supreme court in article 142 moved from its decision say in uh, the union carbide case where it said it had the powers to override existing laws etc to the case of the supreme court bar association where it said you have to only supplement the law and not supplant the law and now we've seen the covid related judgments which extend limitations etc which again uh, was the exercise of powers which okay. might i feel have been exercised by the parliament through an ordinance or a state legislature through an ordinance i just want to know whether there is a case for limiting the exercise of power under article 142 to only constitutional courts and not have non-constitutional courts use 142 no i mean a constitutional bench rather and limit the exercise of the power of 142 by courts which as by the supreme court while deciding inter-party disputes in exercise of its appellate powers well uh, you see under article 142 uh, 
uh, like Justice Venkata Chulaya mentioned in the Union Carbide Judgment, the source of that power is from an independent constitutional provision, which is a reservoir, which is not uh, akin to any statutory power. And that is correct. That's the first point. But when you are exercising that power, you obviously cannot uh, supplant a statute. But if suppose, let us say, a statue is incapable of being complied with. Let's take a case like COVID-19, that it is impossible to, uh, to, to file applications. You, the court can ex to justiciary under Article 142, pass suitable directions because it has that power. And you will notice that in cases where they have passed directions, what are called omnibus or group directions, they have passed in cases where it may not have been just parties before them per se, but they have done it for the collective benefit of a group of people or people who needed to be addressed in a particular way. The question is whether this power is available to high courts uh, under Article Although the Supreme Court has said that they alone have that power because of the presence of Article 142, I have always maintained personally my opinion that discretionary writs by the High Court can also be granted subject to the condition that is not in violation of a statute or is not inconsistent with the statute. But uh, mandamus can be so fashioned. Uh, it depends upon a certain degree of craftsmanship but it can be done. But the fountainhead of power like 142 may not exist in the same width and amplitude, but discretionary writs can be granted under 226. Okay. Thank you, sir. Next question is from Anita. And her question is, is judicial review the sole prerogative of the superior judiciary? Or can other bodies also exercise Judicial review, other bodies exercising adjudicatory functions, can they also exercise judicial review? This is a very good question. Um, the adjudicatory bodies, like tribunals, actually, are meant to be specialized bodies. In judicial review, we are slightly more, uh, we are slightly stepping away from the nature of, let us say, original function like an adjudicatory body, or for that matter of fact, an appellate function, which is sitting in appeal. Therefore, both an adjudicatory body and an appellate body from that adjudication, they have to apprise of facts directly. In other words, they are the sole adjudicators of fact. They have to admit facts, they have to look at the consequences of those facts and they have to determine whether there is a right, whether there is a liability or whether there is any consequence as far as that is concerned. In judicial review, the situation is different. So the determination of fact by adjudicatory bodies is by very nature a slightly different function. It is called what we call as original adjudication like a court, trial court, or let us say a tribunal. But these are first instance adjudications. Appeals from that will also be of the same degree that it is not, it is not hands off approach. It is not looking at a distance approach. It is also as if you yourself are the court in the first instance. That is why the ability to appreciate matters of fact is quite different from what we traditionally understand as judicial review. But there is one very important point which, Anita, you make in this. The quality of independence which is attached to what I described as courts under the Constitution, and I mean all of them, including the fact that under Article 2.28.2, when it says court subordinate to the High Court, it didn't mean subordinate in that sense. It meant subordinate in terms of Article 227, in terms of, shall I say, the powers of revision, which otherwise exist. But the nature of the courts being independent, completely independent of 
any form of executive control is the heart of the matter. Similarly, when we are talking about even original adjudication by tribunals, the comparability must be that if those tribunals can actually result in lawfully enforcing decisions, then they must have the comparable character of what we call as the adjudicatory, uh, as the courts. So their, their, their structure, the men who are appointed there must be as good as judges. That is the point. And that is why I made the point a little while ago about tribunalization. So to sum up, there is a technical distinction between original adjudication and, but at the same time, in terms of the capacity and the manpower who must actually be there, they must be such people who are identically structured as judges. Thank you, sir. Uh, the last question is from Bhaskar. Uh, do you think the time has come to have a national court of appeal, which will exercise the ordinary appellate power of the Supreme Court of India and leave a Supreme Court intact to hear only constitutional issues and, of course, federal interstate issues? And I uh, add one more question, please. Yes. Sai here. How you position 136 in the context of uh, National Court of Appeal, if, it, uh, if at all it comes? Sir, my personal opinion is that fragmenting courts is always not advisable. I have also been, as a, as a legal historian, it's been my personal opinion, entirely my personal opinion, that even the fragmentation of high courts which has happened in this country consequent to whether it be benches or whether it be on account of reorganization of states has also over a period of time uh, weakened the roots of the of the judiciary itself now the fragmentation of courts is something which must always be avoided. A national court of appeal, in my view, sir, is not needed. Secondly, sir, I maintain it depends on how we, if we are in the Supreme Court, we have to enthuse the high courts and the high court, sir, will always rise to the occasion. I have personally seen with my eyes and I am now repeating it to you. And this is the kind of honor which high courts have enjoyed in the Supreme Court. But I am saying it because I have seen it myself. There was a judgment in sales tax from the Madras High Court. It was a judgment written by Justice uh, G. Ramanujan, if my memory is correct. The matter came up before Justice Chinnapareti. Justice Chinnapareti said, uh, I find that this learned judge's judgment is extremely well reasoned and I have been reading a few judgments in tax matters. The conclusion is correct and immediately dismissed the petition. But he said very candidly, I have been reading the judgments and they appeal to me because there is a lot of, I'm now giving you yet another example. That matter came up from the Madhya Pradesh High Court. It came up before Justice said. And it was from a judgment of Justice G.P. Singh, who was a colleague of his, a good friend of his possibly, who didn't have the opportunity to come to the Supreme Court. And he said, this is a judgment by one of the most learned chief justices. And he said, I just want to let you know, he was the one who ought to have been here instead of my place. And we were all stunned that a judge spoke like this. But the point I'm making, sir, is the degree of respect which is accorded is that is the way we will have a complementary system of knowing that the functions which are performed by the High Court are almost at the same level. This idea of National Court of Appeal, sir, I'll tell you, the more courts you invent as appellate courts, the more they will even travel to the Supreme Court. 
Article 136, sir, is again, I submit, is really predominantly only for the Supreme Court. And in fact, if you look at all the orders in the 1950s and 60s, sir, please permit me to say, they had very clearly defined rules for admitting a matter and not admitting a matter. They did not go by any form of perception. They said if there was an error, they would not hesitate to admit the matter. Even if it was an interlocutory order, they would admit the matter. So it is also a matter of certain expectation and judicial discipline by which this can be easily dealt with. To have an intervening court of appeal, in my view, is actually going to be deleterious to both. It will be deleterious to the Supreme Court and because they will have the same number of appeals from the National Court of Appeal. Even if you say it is, if it is uh, final, but people will still approach the Supreme Court for a question of law and it definitely, I think, undermines the position of the high courts. In my view, personally speaking, having regard to the present structure of constitutional courts, unless a national court of appeal is given a constitutional status with the ability to issue similar writs as that of the high court, but sir, that is already addressed by an intra-court appeal in the high courts itself. So I do not see for myself any need to have a National Court of Appeal. It cannot partake of the character of Article 136. 136 is under the Constitution meant exclusively for the Supreme Court. In fact, since the judgment with Justice Ravindran uh, uh, rendered, uh, uh, there, was a, there was a passage where 32, 226, 136, 144, all of them, we read together, which only tells you that 136, as you rightly observed, is within the province of the powers of the Supreme Court. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I now request uh, Bhaskar to uh, thank you, sir. For... Um, I had the pleasant task of proposing the vote of thanks. Um, the, uh, my first Thanks to, thanks is to Mr. Gopal Subramaniam, who has enriched us during this last one hour, one and a half hours, uh, by sharing his thoughts in relation to judicial review and has patiently answered all our questions in relation thereto. I also thank all our guests uh, who have joined us and spent their valuable one and a half hours in this process. Um, I would look forward to more such opportunities in the future uh, for Mr. Gopal Subramaniam to be with us and share his various thoughts on uh, different matters. Uh, again, thank you one and all. Thank you.